So let me give you two signs that humanity is doomed to destroy itself and fall into ruin. One is the image of a guy with an Essex accent butchering Billy Joel at karaoke night. And the other one is Slate.com's headline for their review of Netflix's three-body problem. Let's talk about why. Hi, my name is Paul. This is Artificially Intelligent Education, and I'm starting a new video series on this channel tonight where I'm going to be reviewing Netflix's Three Body Problem. So this is a video about episode one. Uh, all episodes of this series are currently available on Netflix. I watched one episode tonight. I thought it was good, and I decided to make a video about it. I'm not sure if I'm going to keep making videos about it. So if you want to hear more from me about this show, you know what you should do? is like this video, comment on the video, and subscribe to the channel so I know that people are, are digging the content. But here's what we're gonna do in this video tonight, as I've done in a lot of my other series on this channel. I'm gonna quickly go through and summarize the plot of episode one. Um, I'm gonna talk about the history behind this episode and do a little bit about Chinese history in order to explain better what happened in it. I'm going to point out what I think is the bleakest moment from this episode, and this is going to be a bleak show. I'll go ahead and tell you that now. Um, so we're going to highlight the bleakest moment and then I'm going to analyze what I think are the most important themes from the episode and what we should all be paying attention to as the series moves forward. And then I'm going to wrap it up by offering my review of the episode and stressing why the person who wrote the review at Slate.com that I looked at earlier today is full of shit. So let's dig into this. First, I'm going to be spoiling episode one and episode one only. That's as far as I've watched. I will warn you that I did read the book, so I know where the story's headed. I'm going to try not to talk about that, but you know, we'll see how that works out. If I do spoil anything about the broad direction of the book, it will not be intentional and it's going to be fairly subtle. Uh, and what I'll also say about that is I read the book a year ago. I don't remember a lot about it other than like the ideas in it. So take all that for what it's worth. But let's get into a plot summary of what happened in episode one. Um, and I'm going to summarize this by plot because um, there's at least two stories that are happening in this episode and subsequent episodes will probably have more that are taking place at different times in different places. So there were two main storylines in this first episode. The first one is set in China beginning in around 1967, and it concerns a young woman named Ye Wenjie. Uh, Ye, at the beginning of the episode, sees her father killed uh, as part of a show trial put on during the Cultural Revolution. More on that in the history section of this video coming in a little bit. She herself is then arrested and sent to a re-education slash work camp um, where she is put to work doing physical labor, clearing trees as part of some sort of government program. She strikes up a relationship with another academic there because she herself is an accomplished physicist. Um, but it seemingly this guy betrays her in some way because he had given her a book and then he's there when the guards arrest her for possessing a book that was written in English. Um, she is initially tortured uh, after this arrest at the uh, work camp, but then she is transferred to the scientific facility at the top of the mountain that they were doing work for in the uh, education camp um, clearing trees. And she is given the choice to spend the rest of her life working at that camp uh, or to go back to working at that facility or to go back to the regular work education camp. She chooses to stay at the um, research laboratory thing. And again, she's told that she will now have to spend the rest of her life there because of the security clearances involved. We find out at the end of the episode, though, that she did not spend the rest of her life there because she is the mother of a character that we're introduced to in our other plot line. So the other plot line, and again, in the episode, these are cut back and forth together, but I'm summarizing them kind of as two separate cohesive plots. And the other plot line we meet, uh, I'm going to tell this through the lens of this character Dashi, played by Benedict Wong, who you'll recognize from the Marvel movies. Uh, Benedict Wong is playing an investigator of some kind. We find out he's working for some sort of kind of secret organization that's beyond like the regular, this is in London, and he's working for some organization that's above like Scotland Yard and MI5 or whatever. He's working for some sort of super cool secret James Bondy organization, and he is investigating a spate of suicides among noteworthy 
physicists, a few of which seem to have been quite brutal, including one we see where someone has gouged out his own eyes and then written all over the wall um, in his own blood, writing down a countdown clock of some kind. We learn, as he observes a group of British physicists, we learn that there is a problem confronting physics, which is that suddenly particle accelerators all over the world are no longer able to get reliable evidence from their experiments. Suddenly things are happening at these experiments at particle accelerators that contradict everything that people thought they knew about physics. So this is a mystery that they are going to need to solve. We also find out that things are pretty complicated in some weird ways because one of the physicists that we meet is suddenly seeing a clock that is counting down everywhere she looks. Um, no one else can see it, but she sees all the time a clock that's steadily counting down. She meets a mysterious stranger who warns her that she needs to shut down her private company, which makes nanofibers. And if she doesn't do that, the countdown will eventually reach zero. And she doesn't want to know what happens when the countdown reaches zero. Um, she is told that as a demonstration of how significant this is, she should look up at the sky at midnight the next night. And when she does, she and everyone else in London, at least, sees all of the stars blinking on and off, flashing a code that corresponds to that countdown clock. Um, let's see. We also had Jonathan Price being a sneaky guy. He showed up at the funeral for one of the physicists who has um, killed herself. We don't really know what his deal is yet, but Wong is interested in him. And we also know that there is a weird VR headset and that one of the physicists who killed herself had been obsessed with a video game that she was playing on this funky William Gibson looking headset. And we don't know too much else about that yet. So that is the plot. That's what happened in this episode so far. What was the bleakest moment? I'm going to highlight the bleakest moment of every episode if I continue with this video series because it's a bleak novel and I anticipate this being a pretty bleak show. The bleakest moment was uh, when uh, Ye Wen Jae has the water bucket dumped over her head when she is um, in custody after she was caught with the contraband book in the labor camp. Um, and not only does the woman pour the water over her head, but she also pours it all over her cot. As soon as I saw that, I said I didn't remember the novel very well, but as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh no, this is the part where they torture her by pouring cold water all over her when she's in this like frozen work camp in the middle of uh, Mongolia. Um, and yeah, that totally happened. And in fact, in the book, it's worse because she gets like super sick. That was sort of briefly implied in the episode, but they didn't do as much with it. Okay, so that was the bleakest moment. Uh, History Corner, let's talk about the Cultural Revolution. Because one of the things that made the book pretty difficult for me is when I went to read it, I had to have kind of three different Wikipedia tabs open um, so I could try to figure out everything that was going on historically in it. Because the novel was written by uh, a Chinese national um, and he is very informed about Chinese history and that therefore informs the book. And it's one of these things that you realize that like if you get a traditional American education like I did, you learn a lot about like whatever British kings or something, but you don't learn a lot about the history of countries outside of sort of the Western sphere. And so something like the Cultural Revolution is only briefly touched on in, in the schools that I attended. So what is the Cultural Revolution? Well, this happened in the late 1960s, and it was a movement launched by Mao Zedong, who you probably know that Mao was the leader of the Chinese uh, Communist Party during World War II. He is the one who fought and won the Civil War for control of China, and he became the head of the new communist Chinese country. However, as time went on and he got older and new ideas came into vogue, he was being increasingly sidelined by other people in his party and he was no longer as important a figure as he used to be. So he launched a movement among Chinese youth that they needed to rise up against the existing systems, like the four olds of their society. So all the old ideas and old people and things like that and sort of reinvigorate the spirit of the revolution. So he empowered all these young people all across 
across the country to rise up. And they formed these groups and gangs that were called Red Guards. Um, and for years, they fought for control of the country. They took control of cities. They did exactly what you see them doing in this episode where they held these show trials um, and sent people to work camps if they had the wrong ideas and all kinds of things like that. It was awful. Millions of people died. It's one of these things where people talk about like the body count of World War or of uh, 20th century leaders and they're like, well, Mao killed more people than blah, blah, blah. Well, a lot of those numbers come from the Cultural Revolution, which you saw playing out in this episode. Um, in the book, you got even more about the fact that there are like different groups that are at, at odds with each other. So there is an active kind of civil war going on with these different groups of Red Guards who are fighting against each other and also fighting against the Chinese military about like who is truly representing the spirit of the people. It's a pretty awful time. Okay. So let's get into what I think are the major themes that are being developed in this. Um, and I'm going to highlight a couple other couple themes that are being set up here. And I really want to focus on what I'm seeing in the TV show and the decisions that Benioff and Weiss are making and putting the TV show together. So like I said, I know kind of where the story in general is heading for having read the book, but I don't remember a lot of it all that closely. And clearly Benioff and Weiss are making their own choices about the kind of show they want to make here. Um, so I'm going to talk about their choices. Voices and their themes. One theme that I think is really getting developed in this episode is the idea of what I'm calling the malleability of truth. Is there such a thing as absolute truth or is it something that is truth and reality something that you can make your own and distort to your purposes or does it change over time? So this is the initial conversation that you see happening in the episode um, is where uh, Ye Wen Jay's father is being cross-examined by the Red Guards and they are confronting him about physics theories that he has endorsed and they're like, do you believe this? And he keeps saying it's the best explanation. So his attitude is there is a right and a wrong way to look at the universe and you either understand it or you don't. But the Red Guards are making the argument, no, reality is what we say it is and the truth is what we say it is so right away from the very first scene of the show they're introducing this question of like does absolute truth exist or is it something malleable that you can change and then this is picked up by this idea of broken science or broken physics that you see people talking about in this episode this question of like would it be possible for everything that we thought was true about the way the world works to have suddenly started to change and that's what they're trying to figure out so this question of like absolute truth and malleable truth I think is going to be important to the show. Another key theme that's introduced here in this opening episode is the theme of humanity or inhumanity um, because we are seeing we are shown quite a few images of inhumanity and barbarism in this episode and sort of the horrible things that people do to each other. Um, starting again with the show trial sequence where uh, the young woman's father is beaten to death in front of her also, you know, so there's the violence, but there's also the betrayal because um, her mother gives evidence in that trial against her father and sells him out. Um, and then Ye Wen Jay herself is betrayed by this young man who was her lover later when she's in the work camp. So all kinds of things about man's ability to be inhumane. This is also coupled with um, in the environmentalist message of the story. And you see them reacting to the devastation of the natural world that's being caused in the re-education camp when they're cutting down all these trees. So there's a lot in this episode about man's ability to be inhumane. However, it also gets into other aspects of humanity where it talks about connections between people. Um, the book that she had was Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which is the book that launched the environmentalist movement. But the quote that she reads from it is about nothing existing alone. And you see, I think, stress that's being put on human connection in this episode, right? And can people connect with each other? You have this gang of friends, um, the, the physicists that we've met in London. They're all old friends going back a long way, right? And they are united against some sort of common outside threat that they don't really understand, but they're going to, they're trying to rely on each other. So I do think there's going to be this question of, are we able to work together or are we, you know, terrible, horrible things? And we're going to find out. 
The last theme that I think is really being set up in this first episode is the theme of time. Obviously, we have the ticking clock thing, the countdown that we don't really understand what's going on with that yet. But another way that I think this theme of time and time running out or something is being um, created is with the use of cigarettes. Um, it really stood out to me how many people are smoking cigarettes in this show for something that's set in 2024. Everybody's smoking, right? Multiple characters are smoking and talking about cigarettes. And I think cigarettes work as a pretty good metaphor for a ticking clock, right? If you are choosing to smoke cigarettes in 2024, you are aware of the bargain you are making, right? And that you are in fact setting something in motion that you maybe can't stop that at a certain point, the bill is going to come due for that. So that's why I think we've got all this focus on cigarettes and because it's coupling with this idea about time. And one of the last lines in the episode is Ye Wen Jae, who we, when we find out that she has left the base and is now the mother of this character who killed herself, she says, time is a motherfucker, um, which really, again, gets at this theme that's being developed here of um, time, right? So those are some themes to watch out for. All right, let's talk about my review of it. I thought this was good and I enjoyed it. Um, and this is why I'm, I'm well, I'm going to, I'll get to the slate review in a second here, but here's what I liked about it and what I thought was effective about this. I thought the book was fascinating. I'm glad that I read it, but it was not fun to read. It was an absolute chore for me to get through. I had to make myself like, all right, we're going to sit and we're going to knock out a chapter of this thing. And then you can look at TikToks for 10 minutes kind of kind of thing. Whereas this episode I thought went pretty fast and, and I was very engaged with it the whole time. So good for them there. It held my interest. It takes a very complicated story and tells it in a way that makes sense. Now, I have read the book, so maybe the story made more sense to me than it did to other people. So if you are not a book reader and you're watching this, let me know in the comments if you found it more confusing than I did. But I thought they told the story pretty well. I enjoyed the um, performances. I like, you know, Benedict Wong is so much fun in the Marvel movies, but it's fun to see him doing something different. Also, John Bradley, Game of Thrones alum, uh, who was Sam Tarly in that show. Um, good to see him again. I was just listening to a podcast where they were talking about the very middling success of Game of Thrones actors outside of Game of Thrones. And you had all these people who look like they were going to be rock star actors as Game of Thrones is wrapping up. The results are pretty mixed for your Richard Maddens and your Sophie Turners and things. But I'm glad to see that Sam Tarly is landing on his feet and doing some good stuff and still working with Benny Off and Weiss. Um, I'm also going to shout out an actor I didn't know, uh, but Giovanna Depo, who is playing Saul. I'm glad that he's there having fun. That's also what I was going to say about uh, John Bradley as Jack. They're having fun in what's going to be a very dour show. So I'm glad they gave us some characters who are having a good time. One more actor to shout out is Rosalind Chow, um, who is playing Ye Wen Jay, just because I was looking at the Wikipedia and I was like, oh my gosh, that's Keiko O'Brien from Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. So if you happen to be a huge nerd in the 1990s and you were in high school and that made you a super cool person, you know what I'm talking about. Um, things that I didn't like as much about it. Here's my one criticism is there's a distracting number of dead gorgeous people in this show. Um, and it sort of gets at one thing that I think is kind of funny is this show is all about kind of rock star physicists and how important physicists are to everything and like people paying attention to physics. Um, and then they're all played by beautiful people, like distractingly beautiful people. Um, took me out of the episode a little bit. There were multiple times where like a character walked on screen and I was supposed to be listening to what they were saying, but I was like, that's the most attractive person I've ever seen. And that happened two or three times. So I don't know, calm down, Benny Off and Weiss. Um, but what I want to close with is telling you why I'm so pissed off at this Slate headline that I saw today. And I said I read the article. In fact, I only read the headline and was so mad I didn't read it. But the headline was, Benioff and Weiss have been given a second chance to make a show out of, out of a beloved book. And once again, they ruined it. So if you don't know, Benioff and Weiss are the creators of this show, right? Or the people who are making the show based on the Chinese novel. And they also created Game of Thrones, the TV show based on George R.R. Martin's show. Uh, people didn't like the last season of Game of Thrones. I don't know if you know that. I'm something of an apologist for the last season of Game of Thrones. 
Um, my argument being, it's not as good as the other seasons, but that doesn't mean that it's not still better than virtually everything else on TV. And this is why I'm so mad about this language about, like, they ruined it. I mean, calm down, buddy. It's a, it's a show. It's a book. And... It's absurd to argue that Game of Thrones wasn't the best show on television for something like five years running, right? At its absolute peak, there was nothing else on television like it. It was fantastic. And it's absurd not to give Benioff and Weiss some credit for creating that and for doing that. And even if you want to say that, like, well, it's George R. R. Martin's novels. They're George R. R. Martin's novels that everyone would have told you were unfilmable. And they did an excellent job making a TV show that was very satisfying both to faithful Game of Thrones book readers and also to people like me who'd never read the book. It seemed like everyone liked it. And then the last season was kind of disappointing. Um, but nevertheless, everybody enjoyed it up to that point. And I would argue that there are plenty of things in the last season of Game of Thrones that are still pretty good. So I saw no evidence in the first episode of this that anything had been ruined. Um, I really enjoyed it. Maybe it's going to get ruined in the next couple of episodes. But in general, I wish that people on the internet would just calm down a little bit. It's okay that things aren't exactly what you want them to be or you find them a little disappointing. But that's a long way from saying that they've been ruined. There you go. That's my note for you this afternoon, uh, editors of Slate. So like I said, I'm not sure if I'm going to do episodes on the rest of this show or not. So help me out. Watch the video, like the video, subscribe, comment, and we'll see about continuing on with Three Body Problem. But in the meantime, I'm going to be back later this weekend with the latest in my Shakespeare series. Uh, we're going to be doing Comedy of Errors. It's pretty funny. And then I'm going to stick with FX's Shogun, and I'm really trying to make Invincible happen. I really like Invincible and have been posting videos about that. They're doing test pattern numbers right now, so I might have to bail on that if I feel like no one's engaging with it. So if you like Invincible, go watch my video about that. Anyway, have a great rest of your night. Take it easy.